Welcome uh, to this little presentation today, uh, which I hope to give you a little bit of flavour of the, what excites me about uh, working in health policy, both from a teaching and research perspective, and uh, as Anne-Marie flagged, the fact that, um, that this has been a significant part of my life, um, both uh, in an academic, in the academic world, um, as well as in the health service world. Uh, I don't want you to think for a moment that in uh, the 10, 15 minutes that I'm going to talk here, that I'm going to give you the full picture and full solutions to fixing um, the Australian health system, or for that matter, uh, more globally health systems, uh, as they relate to the prevention and management of chronic disease. What I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a flavour um, of the way that uh, health policy fits into finding solutions in relation to this. Um, and, and where some of those, where some of the, uh, the gaps are and some of the barriers to achieving uh, better outcomes in relation to chronic disease. So uh, many of you will, uh, will have seen uh, this, uh, this chart or one of the other numerous charts produced by, uh, the, by this group. This is from a publication in The Lancet last year. And it's a, a tabulation on the global disability adjusted life year ranking, so that's a measure of the level of, uh, of morbidity and mortality um, from different diseases. And it's part of a, a very large study, very gl large global study, which has now been conducted twice, once in 1990 and once in 2010. And the, most, the, the useful part about this is it tells us something about what the health systems around the world are uh, are tackling and importantly now that we have two points of data we get a bit of a sense also of where the trends are uh, in terms of what's actually happening. Now this is data for all countries and essentially showing a ranking um, of these sort of broad categories of, uh, of, uh, of disease and illness um, and you can see that if you just note on there the blue ones, the blue ones are the uh, non-communicable disease or chronic disease aspects you can see that many of these, if not all of them, um, have actually increased in importance between 1990 and 2010. And uh, this is something which is occurring and has been occurring for quite some time in the developed world. The interesting thing is that, uh, one, and one of the great challenges is that this is now also occurring in many developed countries, developing countries. Um, and what we're seeing in some countries is countries who have this double burden where they have still have residual uh, major disability and uh, morbidity and mortality from some of traditional areas uh, of concern like infectious diseases and nutrition um, and undernutrition and then we see uh, this burden now emerging from chronic disease uh, on top of that. So. In, in essence, getting a double whammy, uh, both at the beginning of life and, uh, and then later in life. So this is, it is a global problem that we're facing. And it's interesting when I reflect back that 20 plus years ago when I first started um, in this, I'd finished my training as a, as a, as a specialist in medicine um, and uh, was working on my PhD in epidemiology. And at that point in time, um, uh, it was my area of interest, particularly interest at the time at the time was in cardiovascular disease. We, one of the, what I was actually investigating was looking at some of the causes for the decline that we were seeing in relation to coronary heart disease in Australia, where we've seen a phenomenal 60% decrease in mortality from coronary heart disease since about 1968. Um, and then reflecting on this and thinking about it, I, I started to say, well, you know, where does all this information, where does this evidence that we're producing start to feed into the decisions about what we spend money on in the healthcare system and how we structure the healthcare system. And the more I looked, the more I seemed to see gaps between what we knew and what we could do and, and about where we were investing money um, and what was actually happening in practice. So I became intensely interested in this area and in fact um, ended up going to work for a period of time as uh, 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 for um, seven years in fact um, in the New South Wales Health Department at that point in time um, as the Chief Health Officer uh, and this has, gave, has been a part of a start of a journey for me in understanding um, how health policy evolves, how we can inform it and how we can essentially use it as a tool um, to try and achieve better outcomes in relation to chronic disease. <clears throat> 
As I said, I'm not going to try and cover the whole spectrum, but I'm just going to comment on a couple of things that many of you um, <coughs> may not, uh, many of you may not have come across yet. And I, um, and and, uh, and one of the things I like to try and do is is interest people in different uh, different things and get them to go and have a look. This is an interesting study conducted regularly by a group called the Commonwealth Fund, um, which is based in the U.S. Uh, and um, but. Uh, and has a focus really on the American healthcare system. But as part of that focus, um, has been collecting data, data, comparative data, looking at the, uh, the US healthcare system compared to a range of other countries, um, including Australia. And there's a whole range of different indicators which, are, which they collect to look at. Um, and uh, you can see uh, this sort of pattern here of uh, against these particular items I'm showing there. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the overall rankings there for these, uh, these countries. And you can see, just uh, I'm going to take a bit of an Australian-centric view on the comments here, you can see that um, uh, Australia does e extremely well, ranks number one uh, in relation to long, health healthy, productive lives. That is, we're living longer, we're living healthier um, in relation to that. Um, but that on a number of other parameters, we actually don't score as well as we might like to think we do. So we f hear this rhetoric all the time from politicians and from people talking about the Australian healthcare system being one of the best in the world. Well, certainly in terms of our population approaches and certainly in terms of our health, there's evidence to suggest that. But there is some concerning evidence, for me at least, that says, well, if we benchmark our pace pl ourselves against some other countries, we actually don't, our healthcare system doesn't do as well on all the parameters, and maybe we need to understand that. And one of the areas that when you drill down in this that we don't do well at are the aspects of the system for management of chronic disease. This is, um, again, this is from the Commonwealth Fund, and I'm gonna show you two, just two slides, um, two, I think, which are very interesting. So the, what they did was that they surveyed a range of physicians, doctors, in, uh, in those countries, um, and asked them a series of questions about their healthcare system, and I've just plucked one out for the purposes of the day. And this was, uh, they asked a question which basically said, how well does, do you, how much change do you think is needed in your healthcare system to address the concerns um, that, uh, that, uh, um, that are present and that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think what is really interesting about this is that across almost all of those countries, you can see that the, that, uh, the majority of people were, uh, uh, majority of doctors thought that we needed some fundamental changes to the system to try and address the needs that are there. And Australia was certainly sort of up there in terms of the people who thought that was necessary. Now, interestingly, they also surveyed people, uh, consumers, patients. So these were people who'd had a chronic, who had a chronic condition, who'd had treatment for it in the last 12 months, and they asked them what they thought about the healthcare, their healthcare systems, and how much need they, they thought. Now, again, you can see that in people who are using these healthcare systems, people who need the care from them, again, a very high proportion of, a portion of them are suggesting that there needs to be a reform of these systems to better address their needs. This is patients with chronic disease. So certainly there are some indicators there that we can do better. Now, one of the things that, uh, that's important in thinking about health policy, and one of the things that I've certainly come to learn and while I'm going to talk here in a sort of Australian sense, it's also true of an international sense, that one has to be very, very conscious in thinking about health policy, about the context in which it's occurring. Because what you can do in, in health policy sense varies very much depending on the economy of the, of the country that you're, uh, where, where you're working, uh, the, uh, the, the politics, the organisational structures, um, and uh, in an international sense, um, the drivers uh, that might help you get to, uh, to, to address policy. So for, an extent, ex for example, in Australia, when we think about health policy and what we can do through health policies, we have to recognise that we work in a federation where there are six states, two territories, a commonwealth plus, I don't know how many uh, local governments there are at the local count, uh, at the most recent count, um, that we have to have some impact on. We work in a system which is quite um, where the funding for healthcare comes from a multiple different sites, public insurance, personal funding. Um, we have a range of different providers who are involved in this. We've got a whole range of vested interests who are interested in health, not just for healthcare reasons, but because um, uh, they have uh, financial stakes in it, 
uh, in communities, they'll, they have a, a great deal of ownership of their healthcare system that, uh, and of their hospitals, not just because uh, they provide good care, but they're also a major employer in their communities. So we have to sort of take this into account when we think about health policy. Now, uh, there are a whole range of things that, that we could talk about in relation to, uh, to chronic disease, and I'm just going to mention a couple of them here to give you a bit of an overview of the sorts of things that when we start to think about what are the health policy issues, we have to think about. So if we think in, this, in Australia and, and we think about the system issues in relation to chronic, uh, to chronic disease, um, what we see is a system which is built around um, our, our health care provision system is one which is, continues to be built around the provision of acute care, um, whereas the needs that we're talking about, the growing needs in the community are around, are around chronic and subacute care. So we have a system which is designed to do one thing, um, whereas we have disease patterns uh, which are calling for some quite different methods. I've already flagged the problem of the finance system, which is very fragmented in this country. This leads to funny incentives at different points in the system. So we see in Australia, we see a, an ongoing conflict between the states and the Commonwealth about who's paying for what. That's not very useful if you're a consumer trying to get services. You just want to have uh, those services identified for you. Uh, we have provider incentives which are misaligned. So we reward at a very high level under our fee-for-service system people who do um, investigative work, who do procedural work, things where you, can turn, uh, uh, where you can turn patients over very regularly. We don't reward people for doing the sort of hard yards that are involved in counselling, uh, in, preve in prevention, in uh, providing good mental health services. We have very few standards in, in relation to the provision of chronic care. We have lots of standards about getting access for surgery and for what happens in an emergency department. We have very few as it relates to uh, the provision of care for people with chronic disease. And we have very poor systems for monitoring what we do in relation to provision of care for chronic disease. While the prevention system has been doing a good job, um, and we've seen that, as I said, through the falling in uh, heart disease rates, the fall in, uh, in relation to many cancers. Um, in fact, when we look at it as a system, and, we, and, and, and in general when you're thinking about things from a health policy system, you're thinking about systems, then the prevention system also reflects what the healthcare system is. That is, it's fragmented, it's only loosely coordinated, there are multiple and discontinuous funding sources, which is a real problem in prevention, that people start things but they don't see them through. It is still largely communicably diseased focused, so we have a large investment in people to monitor communicable disease and prevent communicable disease. That's obviously, that's ob obviously absolutely important, um, particularly in the sort of the era of, pan of the risk of pan-endemics, but we need to think about whether or not that structure is appropriate for the issue of chronic disease. It's largely health system focused, whereas we know that for prevention, a number of things we need to do, for example, in the nutrition area, um, uh, will require policy changes outside of the health sector. We do have a national uh, chronic disease strategy um, in Australia yeah. and there are, um, and, and most other uh, developed countries have something similar uh, in terms of this. Um, and one of the aims in health policy um, is to say, well, if this is what we want to achieve, what are the parameters that we need to put in place to achieve that, to, to make that actually happen? What are the things that are going to drive um, achieving uh, person-centred care and optimal self-care. Um, how do we get and how do we um, promote the idea of integrated multidisciplinary care in a system which is essentially at the moment fund people for individual, individual uh, health practitioners for individual services. So we have to think about this in terms of um, the sorts of things that we want to put in place in relation to uh, our health policies and what they do. My last couple of slides that I want to talk about is just to then set some broader context for health policy. As people who come largely from rational basis backgrounds, a lot, particularly those of us who come from health backgrounds, we tend to have come from science with a very strong science background. We think about things in sort of rational, logical ways. And so, you know, we'd like to see health policy as being something which has a rational process to it. And, and this is just one schematic way of of thinking about that, uh, you know, that you start from some point which 
might be a greenfield site where there's no policy, might be an old policy and we want to move to some new policy. We'd like to see the evidence that we know informing how that changes and we'd like to see it, it, it happen in a sort of progressive way that we can inform and, and, uh, and deal with in some sort of rational way. This little diagram here is a map, a system map, of, uh, developed by a group in the UK um, for, the UK, for the UK government looking at the issue of, of tackling obesity. And it's a map of all the different players and all the different elements involved in food, physical activity, um, and uh, the generation of, of, uh, of, uh, of obesity. So if we're thinking about what we want to try and do in that universe from a, uh, of, of complexity with lots and lots of feedback loops that, uh, that affect each other, if we're thinking in that purely linear way about what might happen in that situation, if we think about our health policies in a purely linear way, I don't think it takes a lot of imagination um, to, to realise that we're, gonna get, uh, we're not going to get very far in relation to that. So we have to, be much more com we have to be much more sophisticated in the way that we think about how we intervene and we have to reflect that in the policies that we develop. So just in conclusion then, as I said today, was really just to sort of try and give you a taste more generally um, of uh, the area of health policy and how it applies um, specifically in relation to chronic disease. Very similar issues raise and uh, come up in relation to mental health, which, in, in my mind anyway, is a is a form of chronic disease uh, in most cases. Um, and and in just about every health issue that we look at, you'll see similar sorts of um, issues that arise from a uh, from a, a policy perspective. So, as I've said, chronic disease, mental health are the major causes of morbidity and mortality nationally and globally. There's clear evidence that we can do better at managing and preventing um, uh, chronic disease and certainly managing our mental health better. Um, that it will require policy changes both inside and outside the health sector to achieve that. Policy making is not a linear process, but it can be informed along the way. And research evidence is a critical part of that and how we get the research evidence and, and, uh, and uh, incorporated into that process is one of the things that we're very interested in, both from a research point of view, but it's also something that we try and get across um, in, the, in the Masters of Health Policy. It's also important to remember in that case that not all research evidence is equal, so there are better qualities of evidence, but unfortunately all of that information goes into the, de the decision-making process, so evidence can also misinform decision-making. That context issue, the what, how, where, and when, and who, uh, are all critical in terms of how we formulate policy. They're also critical in the way that we present research evidence to try and inform the policy making body. And as I said down the bottom there, there's actually a growing body of research and tools about what works in presenting research to inform policy and practice, and about trying to develop a, uh, a more sophisticated way of, of achieving it. Of course, at the end of the day, Health policy um, is uh, an extension of the politic, of the politic of the day. So decisions are made which sometimes don't seem rational to us. And one of the other things that we explore uh, a lot in our program is talking about what it is and why do things appear to be irrational because they're not necessarily irrational when you take a broader perspective um, of what they're about. So thank you, thank you for listening to me and uh, happy to take some, some questions about this, a few just of questions about this, but more importantly, if you've got any questions about the program that we, we run. Anna. Um, you've said that the Australian system, and I think you're absolutely right about this, is largely focused on communicable diseases. Are there any jurisdictions that do a better job of prioritizing chronic diseases that we could perhaps look to? I don't know. So, so the question that was, uh, are there places that, that, uh, that do better in terms of building a system that is more focused around chronic disease? Um, th yes, there are. I think there are anyway. I think there are places which, have, uh, which are, uh, are starting to get a, a much better handle on, on, on where to go with in relation to this. Um, the, uh, Canada um, is a country which has established a, an agency uh, for chronic disease prevention. Uh, a coordinating national coordinating agency. It's been it was running for at least uh, 
uh, for a long period of time. Whether it's been dropped, dropped by the, the, the most uh, recent government, I don't know, but it certainly had both a, uh, an infrastructure to try and move to st and change the system around this and had invested quite a lot in the development of tools um, to try and move this through. So I hope it hasn't been lost. You probably know that better than I, uh, whether it has. Um, <laughs> there's a finger of a thumb going down here, so it may well be, as I said, one of the problems in this area is maintaining continuity of getting commitment and a long-term commitment from, from, from governments to, to following these things through. I think there are countries which have got a better integration of the different elements of the system. I think one of the things that we are really problematic in the Australian scene is that we have a very uh, uh, um, dispersed and, and um, unintegrated primary care system and there are places which do much better at integrating um, that and a number of the European countries uh, do better than that. The New Zealand does a lot better than that. Iran has a fantastic primary care system in terms of the way it integ integrates together um, uh, these different elements of, of it. Justin. Andrew, you mentioned some tools of translating research evidence into policy. I just wondered if you wanted to maybe mention a couple of them. Yeah, well, there's a very interesting series uh, of papers developed specifically around this called uh, supports. Um, and these are a whole range of papers. We can easily send people the, the, uh, the link for it. They're open access so that they're easy, they're easy to get access to. There's, I think, about 18 papers. Uh, in that and they're, they're written for users, so they're written to help people do things in relation to better policy and better evidence-informed policy. So that's one of the more comprehensive and open access sets of tools that are available. Um, there are also tools which people have developed to try and guide some of the, the um, external aspects of uh, policy development, of trying to understand the externalities um, better in terms of way. Where I think it's very interesting is that I think in the health, in the health policy area, we haven't uh, uh, seized on um, a lot of the work which has been done in other policy areas um, and, um, and, and brought them in and started to use these tools. And in particular, I think there's a whole set of um, ways of thinking and tools coming from system science and implementation science, um, which will be important in the, in the context of this. And we've really only started to touch on that and starting to bring it in. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Jim Gillespie, who um, is known to people in the room here, but who's also my deputy in the, in the Menzies Centre, has a, 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 one of the reasons that um, I find it great having conversations with him is that he has a sense of that those other environments and he brings that to the table for our discussions and he brings it to the table, as you know, for when we think about how we do research, that sort of set of tools that come on and those perspectives that come from outside of our narrow health view of the world. Yeah. It's yours. Mm -hmm. yeah, professor, I would like to ask about when you do research with patients, with lay people, how can you manage when, how can you know when they are dissatisfied with a particular service or with the entire system? Can they, as lay people, Okay, okay. I think the, the question you're asking is how do you know when it's just their problem with the health system or whether it's a more global problem? Is that the sort of the nature of the no, problem? No, just in Australia, for example, the patient is dissatisfied with some services mm -hmm. but not with the entire system. How can you distinguish that the patient or the lay people, they know that the system is not working well or it's for some doctor or some yeah, yeah, yeah. So whether is it just an isolated problem or is it a more global problem? And the answer to that is that you um, you, you can actually know that from from uh, a series of individuals. You can actually look at a series of individuals and see how they're managed by the system, and you can understand how they. How they're, so one part. Uh, approach to analysis of this is to actually track people through the system and see what actually happens to them, um, but. More globally, it happens because we, we do large-scale surveys where we la ask a lot of people, and if we find a lot of people who are saying, well, their experience of the system is, is not good, then we, I think it's a reflection that there's a problem overall in the system. We can look at the sorts of things that we want to achieve. Um, so, for example, in diabetes care, we know uh, we've got very good evidence of what works for people with diabetes. 
And then when we look at the number of people who get that care, and um, so for example, a study that I was involved with, we surveyed 600 people with diabetes and got them to report their, the type of care they received against what we knew was the best care for people with diabetes. And what we found was that there were some aspects of their care which were very good. So the medical aspects of their care, like testing their blood sugars, etc., were, you know, were, were, were pretty reasonable. But the aspects like the, the uh, diet and physical activity counselling um, was almost um, uh, was extremely low in relation to that. So we know that if these are the things that we want to deliver on, and the system's not delivering on, then there, there's a problem somewhere there in that if we want to if we want to get the best outcomes in relation to it. However, there's another point to your question which I think is really important when we think about health policy, and that is that people's perspectives on healthcare are very personal. You know what you need. Um, you have a very strong, if you've got a, an illness, you have a very strong view about what you think you need for that and about how you wanted it delivered. One of the challenges is that the health system is actually usually designed to, to do things in certain ways and, and so that personal aspects of it is something we have to be very conscious of when we're thinking about um, different approaches in health policy terms. Done? Do politics often get in the way of the implementation of evidence-based health policy? Um, Can you just repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, does politics uh, get in the way of good evidence-based policy? And the answer to that is yes. Um, as I say, we work in a real politic. Um, there, there are a whole range of factors that go into decisions about what health policy we will have. Um, and, uh, and so, and part of that is um, the political orientation uh, of the party of the day. Um, part of it is about the real world politic, that is getting things, trying to address things in a, in a, in a way. And sometimes good, what looks like good policy um, has an unintended consequences. That problem that we've seen there with the complexity of system and not thinking about the full system as it is results, it can result in quite uh, what looks like on the superficially good policy actually having quite distorting effects. An example of that in Australia is that we have a safety net arrangement whereby if people's expenditure reaches a certain point um, then uh, the health care is then their, their, um, the subsidy that they get for, for their health care is much, much higher. Unfortunately, what that actually does in having that in place is it actually is an incentive for people to charge more for services because they know that patients will reach that safety net arrangement and so it has a distorting effect on other aspects of the system. So well-intentioned policy looked like a good idea at the time um, for, for people who need it but the other implications of the policy hadn't actually been thought through well in terms of trying to understand what would actually happen. Because it is a complex system, you change one little bit, it's likely to have some effect somewhere else. Should health policies be whole of government? Um, certainly in the prevention area, I think uh, the, a lot of the things that we're talking about are actually whole, poli whole of government policies. When you think about the built environment and its impact on physical activity, when you think about nutrition and food policy and its effect on uh, people's access to quality nutrition and what they will eat um, in relation to that. These are things which are actually whole of government perspectives that you have to build, bring to it. And, and I think increasingly we're in the, in the prevention world, we recognise that's the case. Of course, that's not something that's new if you think back in, uh, in public health terms, um, if you think back to uh, the Victorian era when people first started to confront the issue of infectious diseases, the solutions were actually not um, in hand washing, they were in putting in proper sewerage systems um, and, uh, and that was uh, a, a, the, um, the impact of having proper sewerage systems was, was immense in terms of the reduction in childhood mortality at the time. That clearly reflected a whole of government view, not just a health view. Someone's just typing at the moment. Um, Got one at the back here, oh, did you? Sorry. Yeah, I, in regard to the surveys of physicians and patients who claim they would see, or they would like to see fundamental changes in the system, was there any opportunity to elaborate on what kind of fundamental changes they had in mind? In the survey? Yeah. Uh, there, there is some information in the survey, it's actually not in the survey, it's when you put together, and this is one of the things in, in health policy research which you end up doing all the time, is that you frequently don't have the information that gives you the exact answer that you want. And you have to draw information from different bits together um, to try and get that. So in this case, 
If you look at that matrix that I presented at the, at the front end, which listed all those different indicators, when you take those indicators and you match that, some of the things which in, that indicator, in those indicators um, against those, some of those survey outcomes, you start to see where some of the, some of the solutions uh, might be in relation to this. There, is other, there are other surveys that people have done uh, asking people at all levels of the system what they think needs to happen in to, to, to make the system more responsive to the needs of chronic disease and mental health in relation to that. Um, and that, that, uh, that strategic, uh, that uh, national strategy that I identified, that I showed a slide of, in, in fact is a synthesis of a lot of, of, lot of, that, uh, lot of that work. We also see that more, uh, very recently in the uh, National Hospital and Health uh, um, Task Force, Reform Task Force, which reported in 2010, which brought together a large amount of information about, um, about the, the Australian healthcare system at least. Um, and, uh, and the sorts of things that needed to be modified to, to change this, particularly some of the discussion papers rather than the actual report itself. The, the background discussion papers provided some really inf interesting insights. Last question. Uh, what are some ideas to improve the fragmented nature of health finance? Okay, so I think there are a couple of things which, uh, which are, which Hopefully, uh, I think we're, we're seeing a progressive move towards having a single government funder. Now, everybody thinks in Australia that this will solve all the problems of the world. It won't, um, it, but it will at least remove one level of, uh, of contest or one level of, uh, of distortion. I think the other critical element um, that the Australian healthcare system will need to address in relation to this is the relationship between private health insurance and other sources of funds. Because at the moment, about 48% of Australians have private health insurance. Um, and at the moment, there is virtually no link between what happens with your private health insurance and what happens through the Medicare. We provide all these public subsidies to private health insurance um, in a whole range of ways. But it's, the system actually hasn't, isn't actually designed to and reflect the fact that we have both those funding sources there. And there are other places that, again, have, have had different models for the way uh, that they do that. The Netherlands has a different model. It's one that's been promoted a lot in, um, in circles at the moment. I'm not sure it's the right model for us. I think one of the other things is that um, we, we rush into adopting policies from elsewhere uh, at our own peril. Uh, we have a unique healthcare system um, and we need to make sure that the solutions that we find actually fit with the type of healthcare system that we have in Australia. And uh, so I'm very wary when somebody says we should adopt that, that approach. Uh, it, it may be a good approach, but we need to recognise what it's actually reflecting. Okay, I think we've sort of probably run out of time. so. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Uh, certainly, if you've got any questions um, or if you want to know more about our master's program, please uh, log on to the website, check it out, and, uh, and please feel free to email either Anne-Marie or myself and we'll get you some information or answer your questions if we can. Thank you very much.